Hello and welcome to this week's statistics tutorial. In this video, I want to talk about the TEC10 output in latent class analysis in M. My name is Christian Geiser. On this channel, I present weekly statistics tutorials, usually related to multivariate statistical models such as structural equation models, confirmatory factor analysis, multi level analysis, and latent class analysis. If this is something that interests you, then please subscribe to this channel. Also, if you like this video, then please hit the like button. In this video, I want to show you a very useful additional output that you can generate in M plus when running latent class analysis. That output is referred to as the technical 10 output or tech 10 output in M plus, and you can get it by specifying output colon tech 10 in one word semicolon when you run your M plus syntax for a latent class analysis. Now, why is it useful? to take a look at this technical 10 output when you run a latent class analysis. The reason is that oftentimes we want to find out whether our latent class model fits well and or if it doesn't fit so well maybe or if we're not sure how well it uh, represents the data then we want to find out why. And so this technical 10 output is um, provides some information on why a model may show misfit or uh, in what way maybe a model doesn't fit so well. So it's kind of comparable to what you get in structural equation modeling when you request a residual output, including the residual covariance matrix and the residual mean vector, where it shows you any discrepancies between the observed covariance structure and the model implied covariance structure, as well as the mean structure. And so here we get something similar with regard to the response patterns. And uh, what we get is very detailed information about our indicators and the different response patterns that were observed for the indicators, as well as how many of the patterns or the frequencies of those patterns that were expected under the model versus that were observed in our data. So the first thing that you can see here in the output for Tech 10 is a listing of all the observed response patterns. In this case, in this example, I used five dichotomous items as indicators of latent classes, and these items were coded as 0 and 1 for the different, for the two possible responses. And so you can see that we have here uh, for example, pattern number one was one where the responses were zero on the first four items and then one on the fifth and last item. Pattern number two was one where the responses were zero to all items. So, for example, this could be about drug use or something like that. So, for example, this pattern number two could indicate somebody who hasn't tried any kind of uh, drug yet whereas pattern number one would then be one where the last type of drug here was um, tried. And so in total, we observed 31 different patterns. You can see here the last pattern is number 31. In total, we could have observed 32 patterns with five dichotomous items. Two by two by two by two by two would be 32. But there was one pattern that we actually did not observe, and therefore M plus doesn't list this last pattern here. Next is a list of the response pattern frequencies and so-called chi-square contributions. So here you can now see, first of all, how frequently each of these 31 patterns was observed in the data. And so you can see pattern number one was observed, for example, 35 times. Pattern number two was a lot more frequently seen, so that's the all zero pattern that was observed 292 times in the data, and so on. So we get this listing of the observed response pattern frequencies for all our for all 31 patterns that were listed above. So that's already interesting because then you can see which patterns were frequently observed versus not so frequently observed, and that by itself might be useful to know. Then in addition, 
And plus also gives you the model estimated frequency for each pattern, or we could say the model implied frequency. And that's kind of similar to what you get in structural equation modeling in a residual output, where you get the model estimated covariance matrix, for example. And so here you can see how uh, often each pattern was expected under the latent class model that was estimated here. In this case, it was a three-class model. And so we're interested in knowing how well does the three-class model reproduce our pattern frequencies. That would be an indication of good model fit if the model implied or model estimated frequencies were all close to the ones that we observed. That would mean the model reproduces these frequencies well. And you can see that here this is the case. You can see there's not a lot of discrepancy between the estimated frequency, for example, for pattern number one and the observed frequency. It was expected slightly more frequently than we observed it one more time, 36 versus 35. The second pattern was expected slightly less fre frequently, so ideally, so to say, we should have observed it only about 291 times, not 292 times, but that's not a huge discrepancy, so to say. Now, you can see that overall this gives you already a sense for um, whether the model is well um, fit or whether the model fits the data well. If you find any large discrepancies here, then that would indicate that maybe the model didn't reproduce a certain frequency adequately. At the same time, it's kind of difficult to see what would constitute a significant discrepancy between model estimated frequency and observed frequency, because those are the raw frequencies. And um, it's, it's difficult to know, for example, whether this here is a significant difference where we observe pattern number 9 21 times, but we should have observed it only about 15 times. So is that, does this mean the model shows significant misfit? And so since this is difficult or honestly impossible to see for the naked eye, what we also get here in M plus in this output are standardized residuals. And again, that parallels what we get in structural equation modeling and factor analysis when we request a residual output, where we also get standardized residuals as z-scores. And you can see that that is given here in the next column, standardized residual z-score. And that is tremendously helpful because this is a measure that we find very easy to interpret. Here what happens is that the difference between the observed and estimated frequency is standardized in such a way that we, ob that we obtain a z-score. And a z-score has a metric that we are uh, familiar with because we know that a z-score of 1.96 or larger indicates a significant value at the 0.05 level for a two-tailed test, and in the same way a value of a z-score of um, negative 1.96 or smaller would also indicate a significant value at the 0.05 level for a two-tailed test. And so this makes it easier for us to find out whether a um, whether a discrepancy between a, uh, an observed and a model estimated frequency is statistically meaningful or statistically significant. You can see there's one here that approaches significance, so to say, according to this 0.05 two-tailed test criterion. This uh, discrepancy between the observed frequency of 11 and the estimated frequency of 6.23 for pattern number 15 yields a z-score of 1.92, so that's still not significant at the 0.05 level for a two-tailed test, but it approaches significance. So you can see this is a, a bit more relevant, um, this discrepancy here. Now, we would still not be concerned because it's not very large, and so what we would typically do is we would go through that list of z-scores and scan it to see if there's any large residual, so anything that's beyond 1.96 or below negative 1.96. And then we could think about whether this is a pattern that is not well reproduced by the model, for example, because we haven't extracted enough classes yet. So that could be uh, something that you might observe if you have a model um, that doesn't have the 
proper number of classes yet where a class is missing that would represent a certain uh, pattern or a certain set of patterns. And so that could be helpful to find out um, why you need to have more classes, for example, or why um, the model doesn't fit. Notice that these scores have different signs because sometimes the observed frequency is smaller than the model implied frequency and in that case you get a negative z-score because the residual is calculated as the observed frequency minus the estimated frequency and then divided by something to standardize it. So these negative signs indicate a frequency that was overestimated by the model when they're negative whereas a positive z-score would indicate that an observed frequency was underestimated by the model. Another thing that we get also in this output is another form, so to say, of standardization of these um, residuals, and that's in terms of a Pearson chi-square contribution. You can see here the um, next column gives you the Pearson chi-square contribution. Remember that in a latent class analysis we have an overall Pearson chi-square fit statistic that allows us to determine whether the model as a whole fits the data well or not. So there's a single chi-square value, Pearson chi-square value, that you can look at that has a p-value that allows you to, um, look, to judge the overall model fit. When the Pearson chi-square value overall is significant, it means the model as a whole would have to be rejected, potentially. And so here we get the contributions of each pattern to the overall Pearson chi-square. That means here you can see which patterns or which residuals contribute most to the overall misfit, whereas the overall chi-square that you get at the top in the model fit information section in M+, doesn't really tell you why your model doesn't fit. It only gives you the overall or summary misfit information. But here you can now see which pattern is particularly um, problematic or yields a large contribution. Again, you can see here pattern number 15 is the one that yields the largest contribution. However, it's still um, pretty modest. For chi-square, for a chi-square contribution, we know that um, 3.84 would be the critical chi-square value for an alpha level of 0.05 for a significance test. And so you can see that this value is smaller than 3.84, still in the same way as the z-score here is smaller than 1.96. So this indicates it's not a significant contribution to the Pearson, the overall Pearson chi-square value. So these are basically, those could be treated in the same way, the z-scores and the Pearson chi-square contribution to find something that is statistically significant or at least that is a large value that sticks out that can tell you something about which pattern is not well reproduced by the model. You also get the log likelihood contribution in the last column here. And then at the bottom, you get the chi-square contribution from empty cells, meaning from unobserved patterns. Remember there was one pattern that wasn't observed here, the pattern number 32 was not observed, the last pattern. And so this is something that also contributes to the chi-square, and it's actually a relatively substantial contribution because this pattern under the model should have also been observed a certain number of times. However, it was observed zero times, and so this yields a chi-square contribution of 4.23, which, which is somewhat large, larger than 3.84. In addition to this um, pattern, misfit information, which is very useful to understand why a model doesn't fit, we also get bivariate model fit information. For the below, bivariate model fit information is about the associations between different items and whether there are any unexplained associations or residual associations between items that the model doesn't explain um, sufficiently. 
Remember that the whole point of latent class analysis is to explain associations between items by introducing latent classes in the same way as factor analysis accounts for covariances between continuous variables by introducing continuous latent factors. And so here the idea then is, or the question is, does the latent class model sufficiently account for those associations between the items? And this is something that you can examine here with this bivariate model fit information table where you get all the associations between different items listed and you can see again whether there are any residuals that are large for different combinations of categories and you can look at the bivariate Pearson chi-square contribution here as well. And so then again, we would scan this and look for any large values in the residual column at the very end. You can see there are no large residuals here for the bivariate associations, which is a good sign, which indicates that the model explains the associations between the items well. So in summary, this technical 10 output is very useful for us to examine model fit in latent class analysis and to understand better why a model may not fit so well and or to check whether a model does fit well. In this case, to me, this looks like this model here fits pretty well. I didn't see any really large residuals here. And so this is probably an acceptable model in this case. In other cases, you might have to extract additional classes or you might have to think about what could be other reasons for why this latent class model um, doesn't fit so well. I hope you found this video useful. Please also check out the description for additional workshops and other videos. And please don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the like button in case you like this video. I'll see you next week.